Why do Jewish people win so many Nobel Prizes? The numbers are staggering. They make up just 0.2% of the world's population, yet they've won 22% of Nobel Prizes. Per capita, a Jewish person is 110 times more likely to win a Nobel Prize than anyone else on the planet. So why? Is it culture, education, genetics, something else? The elephant in the room is this. How does such a tiny group of people dominate the most prestigious intellectual awards on earth? And why do some people insist there's something off about it? Hey, I'm Ken LaCourt. I try to tackle uncomfortable questions in a direct, reasoned way, thought-provoking, but not provocative for the sake of it. I get smarter researching these, and I hope you get some of that too. In this video, we'll break down some of the overall statistics, answer the question why, then explore some alternative theories and controversies, like genetics, that most people usually avoid. Okay, so the statistics. They're kind of mind-blowing. The Nobel Prize is essentially the highest honor you can get for intellectual and scientific research. Each year, prizes are given out in six categories. Physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, peace, and economics. And while Jews make up a tiny fraction of the world's population, they've won 216 out of the total 965 of these awards ever given. Even when you narrow the comparison to the educated, developed nations, the pattern still holds. Jews make up, for instance, just 2% of the U.S. population, but have earned 27% of all American Nobel Prizes awarded in the 20th century. All right, so here are a few kind of crazy comparisons. The number of Jews living in New York City who've won a Nobel Prize is over 12 times the number earned by everyone from China. With a billion and a half people, they have only three Nobel laureates, although they'd include Taiwan and claim seven. This single school, the Bronx High School of Science in New York, has produced eight Jewish Nobel laureates. That's more than most nations. And there are other hotspots like this throughout the United States and Europe. And this Jewish success isn't a Nobel Prize phenomenon either. You can look at the Fields Medal in mathematics or the Turing Award for computer science, and they represent about 25% of those recipients as well. Now, the numbers weren't always this high. Before World War II, Jewish representation among Nobel laureates was lower, although still impressive, hovering at around 8 to 10%. Then something changed. After World War II, Jewish Nobel Prizes had doubled to around 20 to 30%. The reason? Adolf Hitler. Jewish scientists like Albert Einstein were hounded out of Nazi Germany and relocated to the U.S. or Britain, where they joined elite universities and research labs. And a good thing, too since many of those scientists were fundamental to developing the nuclear bomb, which eventually helped out the United States. So Jewish representation in Nobel Prizes, it's not random, and it's not new. It's a long-standing global trend that reflects something deeper, something about culture, history, and intellectual tradition. Okay, so why? Well, when you dig into it, it's pretty clear that it's not about just raw intelligence. It's about a cultural emphasis on education, intellectualism, and debate. And it's been that way for years centuries. The word Torah literally means teaching, and Jewish tradition places an almost sacred emphasis on scholarship. Unlike a lot of cultures where religious texts are basically memorized and accepted without question, Judaism has always encouraged argument, debate, critical thinking, and that extends beyond religion into concepts that help maintain the community. The late rabbi Jonathan Sachs put it this way, you need an army to defend a country, but to defend an identity, you need a school. So Jewish resilience across centuries was built more on education than military might. By the Middle Ages, Jewish populations had significantly higher literacy rates than most of their non-Jewish neighbors. And it grew stronger in modern times. Jewish immigrants to the United States and Europe, many arriving with little to their name, they saw higher education as the clearest path to success. Other immigrant groups focused more on land ownership or trade, but Jewish families poured their efforts into academic achievement. Parents drilled it into their children that education wasn't just an advantage, it was necessary. Nobel Prize winning physicist Isidore Rabbi credited his mom. He noted that while other parents would ask their kids, what did you learn in school today? She'd ask, did you ask a good question today? And that subtle shift from passive learning and absorbing to active questioning that captures the essence of Jewish intellectual culture. But culture alone isn't enough to explain the sheer scale of Jewish Nobel Prize dominance. History plays a crucial role here as well. Because for centuries, Jews were outsiders in most societies, barred from land ownership, guilds, and political power. That pushed them into professions that relied on intellectual capacity. Fields like medicine, law, finance, academia. Precisely the fields that later became Nobel Prize pipelines. Then came a turning point. World War II and the mass migration of Jewish scientists, as I mentioned. And it wasn't just those immigrants who succeeded in the new countries. They helped others. 
I mean, Nobel caliber minds mentored the next generation of Jewish scientists, and they created a self-perpetuating cycle of success. Richard Feynman was one of the most brilliant physicists of the 20th century, and he was shaped by his mentors, the Oppenheimers, who were both part of this Jewish intellectual network. This cycle of mentorship wasn't accidental, and it explains why once Jews became dominant in certain disciplines, they remained dominant for decades. Another huge factor, geography. Jewish Nobel success is overwhelmingly a Western phenomenon. Jews who lived in Russia, the Middle East, or Latin America, places without top universities, they didn't do as well. But when they moved to countries that prioritized higher education, especially the United States, Britain, and France, and Germany before World War II, their achievements soared. So what does this say? It, it says that Jewish Nobel success, it's not the result of any single factor. It's the overlapping effects of culture, history, exclusion, opportunity, and intellectual networking. And it may seem like a unique story, but it's a universal blueprint for intellectual achievement everywhere. We see similar patterns in other high achieving groups, like Indian Americans in tech and medicine. You know, Indian Americans now make up 80% of America's spelling bee winners. We see these same factors helping Chinese and Korean scientists today, and they're becoming powerhouses in global research. Hey, two quick things. One, if I make any serious mistake here, and I make mistakes, yell at me in the comments. I will make it into a pinned comment below, and I'll explain it and apologize if I have to. And also, subscribe if you want to keep seeing these. Okay, so there are some alternative theories and controversies that I need to mention as well. I mean, you can't talk about Jewish success, or maybe any group's outsized success, without a mention of genetics and at least one conspiracy theory. You know, when a small group wins big, people naturally ask, is that meritocracy or is something else going on? And one of the most uncomfortable discussion revolves around genetics and IQ. Researchers like Gregory Cochran and Charles Murray, they've suggested that Ashkenazi Jews have a higher average IQ, like 110 to 115, compared to the general population. Their theory, essentially a Darwin notion of intellectualism, meaning that historically Jews served in professions that did take a lot of abstract reasoning that I talked about, law, medicine, finance, where cognitive ability meant survival and advancement. Over generations, maybe you just end up with smarter people. But to be honest, it's tough to find serious academics with the balls to talk about race and IQ these days. I mean, they're landmines that even if you're right, your career is always a step away from exploding. So for someone like me trying to research into it, I usually either find very politically nuanced, correct oatmeal, or I find racists. But on this topic, even those who support a genetic hypothesis, they admit that culture and environmental factors play massive roles here. Then we should address the claim that Jewish success here is due to some type of cheating, a favoritism or bias in the selection committees. They say that because Jews have strong representation in academia, they have a disproportionate influence over the nominations and that it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle of success. But does that argument hold up? Well, the Nobel Prize committees are overwhelmingly Scandinavian and they're historically dominated by Swedish and Norwegian scientists who are largely non-Jewish. The selection process is secretive, decentralized, and it makes it somewhat difficult to manipulate. And if there was a systematic bias in favor of Jews, we'd probably see erratic patterns and not a steady centuries-long overrepresentation. And we should also acknowledge that for many years, Jews faced just overt discrimination. Lise Meitner, a Jewish physicist in Nazi Germany, she co-discovered nuclear fission, which of course led to nuclear power and the atomic bomb. But when the Nobel Prize was awarded, it went to her male collaborator, Otto Hahn, and she got nothing. Even Albert Einstein's theory of relativity was initially dismissed by some European physicists because of anti-Semitism. But there is some validity to the point I made earlier about networks. Groups help each other, whether it's by ethnicity, by religion, Ivy League graduates on Wall Street, or USC grads helping each other network around town. So you can't completely dismiss the notion that similar people help out one another. And I touched on geography early, but it's often overlooked in this whole debate. These awards overwhelmingly go to research coming out of Europe and North America. And that's where Jewish scientists have been concentrated, especially in the United States. In fact, the United States accounts for 43% of the Nobel laureates in the world. In the US, Jews are overrepresented, not 100 to one, but closer to 10 to one. So that's still an outlier, but one helped by being an American. Now, that doesn't diminish anyone's achievements, but it shows how access to elite academic institutions is a major factor as well. So is Jewish success here a matter of talent and hard work or about some systemic advantages as well? And the answer is yes, it all plays a role. If I had to boil it down to the most important factors, from my point of view, I'd say that Jewish success here comes down to two main elements and that both were needed. The Jewish culture of education and having that culture be located in a country that helps it thrive.
Those are lessons for individuals, they're lessons for families, and it's lessons for the broader society. Hey, if you're liking these videos, I have two others that you might be interested in. One is why Jews have been subjected to so much hate throughout history. I mean, why them? There's a lot to unpack. But if you're done with Judaism for now, consider this lighter one that looks at President Obama's official portrait and whether it has a hidden sperm painted on his head. The algorithm doesn't like this one, but I guarantee you'll find it interesting. Hey, thanks for watching.